thank you very much for uh, inviting me and for having me uh, here. And for, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful to come from, uh, from the uh, West Bank and uh, see, what, see what the other, how the other half lives. I've been, um, I'm a cultural anthropologist and I've been working uh, in, a, in the estuary of one of the great rivers in the world, the Sepik River, since I was a kid. And uh, in the past number of years, uh, the, uh, this intertidal uh, mangrove environment has become uh, subject to increasing uh, tidal surges during the uh, wet season between uh, uh, October and May. And uh, they've, uh, the range of these surges has gotten such that the uh, beachfront peoples that I've been working with have uh, been uh, dealing with having to negotiate and think about relocating. Uh, for the last eight or nine years. And uh, as a result of this uh, vulnerability and uh, anxiety uh, of theirs and mine, uh, I've uh, turned from uh, focusing on the social and social issues and social change and so forth to uh, the, uh, this environment that I would basically boat through uh, and deposit myself in, in communities and then ignore, uh, except for the fact that I ate the seafood uh, with great relish. <laughs> uh, so for the last three years, I've been uh, spending uh, part of my uh, our summer up here in, the, in this uh, part of the world, uh, back in the Murick Lakes, uh, doing research on the, uh, the meaning of the, uh, of this mangrove lagoon uh, from the point of view of the, uh, of the local people, the Murek people. And uh, this, is the, this presentation uh, is the start of uh, the sort of write-up phase and analytical phase of my project, which uh, should <laughs> result uh, in a book at some point, hopefully before, uh, before sea le the rising sea levels destroy the, uh, the lagoon completely or inundate the lagoon completely. Okay, so mangrove ecology, as, as probably some of you uh, know, has been uh, discussed, analyzed, researched in a number of ways um, from the point of view of uh, how mangroves adapt to uh, a highly saline environment. Uh, from the point of view of their reproductive processes, their zonation has been uh, differentiated. Uh, they've been, uh, the fauna, mangrove fauna, have been uh, cataloged. Uh, the distribution of mangroves have been mapped. Uh, and then in most, uh, in the last number of years, their, their effectiveness at providing ecosystem services has been emphasized. Um, which, among which are protection from storm surges, the service of provisioning services for, for the people that live along them, and of course provisioning services for wildlife. Now, in the last five years or so, the United States, the United Nations rather, has recognized them for their capacity to sequester carbon. And their capacity to sequester carbon has been, yeah, has been measured as uh, twice as effective as uh, rainforests. So they've been included in the Red Plus uh, program, the Red Plus program which hasn't really begun uh, in Papua New Guinea uh, for lack of funding. And that has added another dimension to the value and interest uh, of mangroves uh, on a worldwide basis. In a report, uh, that uh, the, the UNEP has filed, they talk about blue carbon as, uh, the, as the number of ways that oceans uh, can effectively act as uh, carbon sinks. And in, their, uh, in this report, what do they depict? They depict mangrove prop roots, which are seen on the right, on my, 
on your, on your right. And you can see here uh, mangroves are listed among their, uh, their top uh, agents for carbon sequestration. So what I want to talk about is the, di the different uh, ways in which mangroves are understood in this part of the world by the indigenous people, uh, these people who live uh, in the estuary of the Sepik River in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is located just north uh, east of uh, uh, Queensland in Australia and was a, uh, an Australian colony uh, until 1975. Uh, the Muric Lakes themselves uh, are a um, brackish mangrove lagoon which are fed by this large Sepik River by the, uh, and by the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the people who live al along the beachfront, the, uh, the beaches are the Muric people and there's about uh, 2,500 to 3,000 of them plus another 2,000 who have relocated to various towns uh, in, in the country partly because of, uh, of uh, sea level rise in recent years. The, this is a bit of a difficult map to read, but uh, there's been some archaeology uh, on the uh, focusing on um, the uh, finding middens of seashells at where they shouldn't be uh, quite inland. And uh, the two archaeologists who've done this work have concluded that there was a vast inland sea uh, up until about 6,000 years ago, which then uh, began to infill uh, 4,000 years ago, resulting in the formation of deltaic <laughs> plains and the seawards progradation of the coastline, uh, leaving uh, the current environment of beach ridges, sand barriers, and mangrove-fringed coastal lakes, which, of which uh, the Muric Lakes are the last remaining uh, remnant of this inland sea. The Muric people themselves uh, talk about in their oral history of resettling uh, along the lakes 200 to 300 years ago. That's not right. This is what I want. And these are the Muric Lakes seen from the air. There's two major channels. You can see the first one there, uh, which through which the Pacific, Pacific tides flow into the lakes. I think the other channel appears there. It's coming up. And this is uh, simply what a, a, a larger channel, a moderate, moderately sized channel looks like and feels like as you boat through it uh, on the way into, the, into a one of the communities, one of the Mura communities. And you don't have to, fortunately, you don't have to listen to the outboard motor <laughs> or smell the gas. So this is one of the five beachfront communities that the Muric live in. It's off the grid. There's no, uh, there's no uh, running water, no electricity. There's no, um, there's no uh, social, tech, social media. There's Kind of 
they only eat seafood. It's wonderful. Okay, so I just uh, want to talk about the, what the Murek Lakes mean to the Murek people in this, in this moment when the Murek Lakes are uh, vulnerable to inundation and destruction. First of all, they are uh, their, their commons uh, uh, from which they, uh, they, which they exploit uh, for uh, their seafood. The, um, uh, the, the mangroves are, um, of course, divided, their species of mangroves are, I think there's 50 of them, uh, 54 of them, but I, I, th I believe there's 14 or 15 within the Murek Lakes themselves. Uh, what's interesting uh, about the Murek classification of mangroves uh, is that they apply gender to them, which is not applied to, uh, you know, in the, in the Linnaean taxonomy. These taller white bark mangroves, they call male mangroves. There's a kid standing. You can see that little kid? Uh, whereas the shorter ones are, they call female mangroves. The female mangroves uh, are, uh, have these viviparous roots that drop down, which you can see in this picture, and then float uh, float away and deposit themselves uh, in, the gra in, the, uh, in the mud at some point uh, where, they f where, where they're able to. Um, the, the viviparous uh, reproduction cycle is, uh, means that their seeds, these seeds that you see are germinating while still attached to, their, uh, to the trees. And uh, here you could see juvenile, man juvenile mangroves in the, midst, in, in the middle of a village, uh, in, the mil in the middle of daily life of a village, which the laundry is supposed to represent. So the Murek use mangroves to, for firewood. They use mangroves to build their houses. Uh, they use a particular kind of species of mangrove to, uh, for the ridge posts of their houses and for the vertical king posts of their houses, uh, which they uh, recognize and name. They use the, the, the lakes themselves uh, to practice what we call technically aquatic foraging, which means that they uh, operate a small-scale fishery for, for a living. Uh, a fishery which is organized in terms of a sexual division of labor, which I'll show you um, uh, now. Men, uh, men use uh, gill nets to fish, and they use, and women use drop lines to fish. Women uh, are responsible for the daily catch, for uh, daily subsistence. Uh, Men also use, let's see, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, yeah, it's visible. Uh, this boy is uh, spearfishing. And uh, spearfishing is really uh, for young, for, for you male youth. And then they, uh, when, when they get older, they buy uh, nets. This woman is diving for clams. The Murek Lakes have about a dozen uh, crustaceans uh, the, in them, that grow in them, and they're somewhat seasonal. Uh, and uh, there's firewood canoe. Now, one of the most important ways in which the Murek think of their environment is as property, as private property. And in this picture, you could see in the, in the background a small building which is uh, akin to a, uh, what we would call a Minnesota cabin, uh, to which families repair for certain periods of time, a couple of weeks, and just fish and gather shellfish in order to go to market or to get away from the hustle and bustle and noise of a daily, of a, a, a village life. Each family, uh, in a community will have their own private cabin. 
that they go to and work from, base themselves in and work from. And if the villages are off the grid, these cabins are way off the grid. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, you can get a radio signal there, and you can hear the news. But apart from that, you're, you're very much uh, isolated uh, from, from modernity and from the state and, and, uh, and from other, uh, other kin groups, other family groups in your community. Uh, one of the major uh, kinds of data that I collected in the last three years uh, have to do, had, has to do with the ownership and history and usages of little inlets or little channels called Yang An in the Muric vernacular uh, that are built by men for kinswomen uh, who then use them to uh, gather shellfish and uh, uh, sand crabs. Uh, these are private channels, and they're very, um, uh, they're not to be used by, uh, by uh, uh, non-kin uh, who uh, have no rights to them. They're, uh, when at low tide, women go to them, gather shellfish and uh, sand crabs, and then return uh, to, the, uh, to the village to process them. Uh, each, what the, the entire Muric Lakes is dotted by these hand-built, man-made channels. Um, and each of them is named, and each of them is uh, privately owned. And, and what, what I did was I got a boat and went around with people, informants, uh, during three field seasons and collected the names and the uh, property rights and the histories of all of the channels in the, uh, in the Muric Lakes, or a good percentage of them anyway. Which the Muric viewed as recognizing uh, something important to them. So the, the clams uh, that are collected from these channels are then brought back to the village where they're processed into, they're smoked is what they are, they're smoked into a kind of a jerky and put on little uh, sticks and then sold at market uh, or traded, bartered uh, at, at, at local markets for carbohydrates that the Muric eat, which is uh, made of st uh, sago starch. And then the sago starch is rehydrated and made into a pudding that they eat with their seafood. The, uh, the yang an, the channels, are, as I say, uh, extremely important uh, property to the Muric. And they, above all else, don't want non-kin using them. And this channel was apparently, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd say, pirated by uh, non-kin, and as a result, the family who own it put up these property markers at the mouth of the channel to, uh, and presumably, uh, uh, what would you say, not bless them, but bespelled them with magic, magical power, so that if they were uh, touched or otherwise taken down, the people who did so would get, get sick. So uh, I had a GPS uh, with me, and uh, this is part of this in the next image will our, our two maps, uh, which I then had made on Google Earth, that indicate the prevalence and the number of all of these little channels. The lakes themselves then in this from seen from this point of view, represent. Muric society represent all the groups that belong to that have citizenship in Muric society, and uh, and not only that, the, the, these uh, channels represent the history of uh, of the society as well, because to a large extent, the the channels were dug by ancestors, ancestors whose names people know, uh, dug for 
their ancestors for their wives or for their daughters so that they would become what they call the mothers of the channel and then exploit its, uh, its resources. The, um, the second way, uh, if, the first, uh, if the first meaning of the lakes for the Murek people is as resource, material resource. The second meaning of the lakes for them is as a, a, a space in which communication takes place. And uh, there is some interesting uh, symbolic uh, uses of the, of the, of the trees that uh, I'm going to talk about. Here you see uh, simply canoes, uh, families in canoes stopping to chat. Uh, en route uh, to market, or en route back from market. So it becomes a, uh, a medium. The, the water becomes a medium uh, for communication. Uh, again, uh, mo it becomes also a, a medium for mobility for people. Uh, in the past, however, the lakes also provided uh, a space for Privacy, privacy away from uh, daily life where uh, everybody, where there's no anonymity, where everybody knows everybody else, where everybody's involved in everybody else's business. Um, this is a little platform that was built at one point uh, so that uh, a young man could meet his lover and uh, have intercourse or at least have private, uh, uh, intimate, uh, and private time. Uh, and these uh, kinds of uh, platforms are usually not visible. Uh, they're, they're usually built so uh, only uh, the person, only the man who's built them knows where they are and his girlfriend. Uh, but one of the th uh, oddities, I guess you could say, that dot the Murek, uh, sort of skyline of the Murek, of the mangrove forests, are these uh, trees whose leaves have been cleared up to this little top uh, area. And these have been cleared, uh, the leaves have been cleared off deliberately by a young man who's had, or a young woman, who's had uh, sex with his partner. And uh, the, the tree is then named for the lover, and, and that moment of intimacy or uh, contact, intimate contact, is then uh, commemorated by this, uh, by this, um, by this symbol. And these kinds of uh, and, and these kinds of symbols, these sim these kinds of markers, uh, are everywhere in the Murek Lakes. Now, the other form of communication that you see everywhere is graffiti. Uh, today, we call it the the, the trunks are tagged uh, by uh, young men, and they write their names in English on them, partly to claim them and if they want to use them, cut them down to, for house building purposes, also partly just to leave a trail of identity behind. There's uh, the, 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 the mangrove trunks are um, a, uh, a wall that people use, that, that young men use uh, to um, to define who they are. Now, uh, in this image, we see a, a ladder that's been uh, attached to this uh, um, tree. Uh, and that ladder, the claim is that this is a spot where you can get, at a certain time, very, very early in the morning, a mobile phone signal. <laughs> <laughs> and by which you can then call town and greet your, your kin there, 
or a call town and say, you know, you want them to send you some, bring something back from town uh, for you. And each of the villages has a, such a spot uh, where, and it's usually early morning or late afternoon that the claim is made, you can go there and you can get a signal. And, uh, but I never succeeded, personally. <laughs> No, I didn't. I didn't go. I didn't go to that that one. But I went to other ones, and uh, I never was able to get a signal. So, but the the mobile phone is part of this use of the of the mangroves as a communicative or as a space which allows for communication, whether it's by canoe, or to meet a lover, or to you know draw carve graffiti into a trunk. The mobile phone is just a a lineal descendant of our lineal contemporary uh, uh, descendant of, of how the, 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 uh, the forests have been used for communication. So today, the, um, the lakes have been, uh, have become vulnerable, have become risk, have become a, a, a risk, a risky place to live. Uh, particularly during the rainy, sea, the rainy season. And in this picture, you could see one of the villages. It's right on the beach. All the shells have been deposited on the, on the beach. Uh, the beach is littered with uh, coconut trunks that have been, this coconuts that have been destroyed by, uh, by storm surges and by sea levels, uh, by, by uh, rising sea levels. And, and the people uh, are worried. And the, the state, in fact, uh, the state of Papua New Guinea uh, set aside a number of million uh, of the local currency to uh, provide them with uh, resources to pay inland land landowners so that they could re uh, find a space to, to resettle, which the Murek uh, refused to accept because they said, uh, you know, we've, we've lived with rising sea levels for 100 years, for 200 years. We know how to live here, and why should we leave? On the other hand, uh, damage is done every, every wet season. Houses are destroyed in addition to uh, coconuts. And so, the, uh, the, for the moment, the uh, environment is deteriorating, but it hasn't become uh, uninhabitable. So they, they build these, or they try these adaptations, a bridge made out of canoe sides, over, um, built up over um, uh, extremely disgusting mud to walk through, that in which your feet sink up to your ankles. Now, the other thing that's happening is the rumor of payoffs. The rumor that uh, when the United Nations Red Plus program starts to, uh, or gets funded and, and arrives in Papua New Guinea, that mangroves will be compensated. The owner, owners of mangroves will be compensated for looking after them because of their ability to. And I said to New York people, why? What's the, what's the value of mangroves? And uh, collected some local views of carbon trade that are interesting. First of all, it's a cash cow. A lot of money will come. Uh, and so they need to prepare, they think. They need to get licenses for their family groups. Registration, they have to register their family groups. Uh, at the same time, they recognize and they are approached by local companies who, who want to serve as intermediaries and represent them. Uh, to, um, to the United Nations or to foreign investors. 
And these uh, local PNG companies are led by guys who are called carbon cowboys uh, in Papua New Guinea, who basically, um, if they're not fraudulent, they have their own interests in mind as individuals more than uh, the communities that they represent. One of them was a guy called Eric Komang, who his name kept coming up uh, in my discussions uh, this past uh, August. And so I went to, I, I, well, let me, I'm sorry, I, look, I'll get to him in a minute. Uh, the local views of carbon trade. They will buy our wind. They will erect a dish and pull good wind and pay us for it and send it to Asia. And then this Eric Komang was referred to. And uh, so I went to him and, uh, all right, here's another, another, I'm sorry, another view of wind. It's dirty smoke that comes from machines, it's destroyed everything. They want to buy our air. All right, so I finally I go to this Eric Komang who claims that he alone, as opposed to the other eight companies, is trustworthy, reliable. The rest of them are carbon cowboys. He is, uh, he's not. And uh, he explain, explains to me that they're waiting for the government to pass legislation uh, to regulate carbon markets and how he would distribute the money uh, if, if, that, if that regulation, if that legislation was passed, and how you shouldn't trust anybody but him. The rest of the, there are plenty of carbon cowboys, but not, he, is only the, he was the only representative of the, uh, uh, that was reliable. So in all, the, 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 this is a frontier. The Muric Lakes is a, a kind of a post-colonial frontier. The environment is valuable now for a new reason because of its uh, value as a carbon sink. But the, the payments for, uh, uh, for that value uh, have yet to start. And they are contested and subject to fraud. And uh, in the meantime, the environment there is um, annually inundated by in ever higher sea levels. So it's, a, uh, it's an environment which is uh, at risk, and that risk is uh, present and uh, getting worse. So that's, that's my presentation.